A very good afternoon, everybody. Mr. Harshpati Singhania, President of the All India Management Association and Vice Chairman and Managing Director, JK Paper Limited. Ms. Natasha Zangin, Counselor, Head of Economic and Commercial Mission, Embassy of Israel, New Delhi. Ms. Lali David, Partner Business Development, Our Crowd. Maria, Dan, ladies and gentlemen. It is a real pleasure to have you with us today and a very warm welcome to this joint program by IMA and our crowd. Mr. Singhania, it is great to have you here today and many thanks for sparing time from your very busy schedule to address this session. You head one of India's largest paper companies and your family conglomerate is involved in a wide range of businesses, including paper, tires, cement, food, agriculture, financial services, technology, and education. The companies in your group are known for innovative products. And as a business leader, you're a strong supporter of innovation. Thank you very much once again, and a very warm welcome to you. Natasha, wonderful to have you join us today, your maiden program with IMA, and the first of many, I hope. Thank you for your participation in this dialogue. India is your first foreign posting, and the fact that you joined the embassy in September at the height of COVID is a testimony to your enthusiasm for our country. I'm sure that you'll find your stay in India fruitful and enjoyable. You have come at a time when India is transforming into a new society and economy, and there'll be enormous opportunities for you to develop business to business and people to people cooperation. A warm welcome to you. Ms. Lali David, it's a pleasure to have you with us today for the India-Israel Dialogue. You have an extensive and varied leadership experience across private and public sectors. You have worked with the law firm in New York on mergers and acquisitions and security offerings, and you've held senior management positions in many industries. You've also been the CEO of a green manufacturing startup. Thank you for joining us and a warm welcome to you. I must specially thank and mention Ma Maria uh, Nemanman, Deputy Head of Trade and Economic Mission of Israel in India, and a very dear friend of IMA for her initiative, support, and involvement to make this event happen. You're on your way back to Israel and you'll be greatly missed by us, Maria. A special thanks to Dan Fischel and Ellie and his amazing and their amazing team at Our Crowd for all the help and support to the program. Our Crowd is an excellent partner to work with and there is great convergence between our mandate. IMA is the apex body for management in India and it provides multiple platforms for global dialogue on business and management. IMA holds many leadership programs overseas, especially in North America and Europe. We have strong relationships with leading global universities, including UC Berkeley, St. Gallen, and Imperial College London, and we collaborate with global think tanks and policy advisors such as Horasis and Covington. In the past couple of years, IMA has invited regular business, has initiated regular business visits to Israel and has also held a global management program there. This year, we were all set to go with a high profile CEO's visit when due to COVID, we had to literally cancel a day before. Hopefully the situation will be normal soon and we'll be able to resume our visit. However, COVID has a silver lining. It has encouraged everyone to use technology to meet and talk more frequently than was possible physically. This session is a result of this new trend. Indian companies are extremely keen to explore business and learning opportunities in Israel, which has become a leader in technologies across weapons, agriculture, pharmaceuticals, chemicals, and of course, digitization and cybersecurity. There is a lot of excitement about today's session about innovation, and I'm sure our audience would find this dialogue extremely useful. The trade and investment between India and Israel is at the cusp of explosion, and I'm sure this session would contribute towards that. Innovation was already a focus area for Indian companies before the COVID era, as new technologies and business models were disrupting the old world. However, COVID has forced everyone to think differently and creatively. The threat of business suspension, even closure, has injected a sense of urgency in innovation efforts that were lacking earlier. To start with, most Indian companies have gone digital during the COVID period, and that has laid the foundation of rapid innovation. Using cloud and mobile technologies, Indian enterprises have reduced the cost of doing, in, of doing business and increased productivity. Now they have the tools and the mindset to utilize the potential of the business data for innovation. The new directness of contact with customers 
and the data on their consumption can be used for identifying unmet needs and creating new products and services. The forced digitization has prompted innovation initiatives that are necessary to survive disruption and to become fit for success in the new normal. I'm confident that this session will help Indian and Israeli business leaders benefit from each other's experience and insights and identify opportunities for collaboration. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure now to invite our next speaker, Natasha from the Embassy of Israel. Over to you, Natasha. Thank you, Rekha, for your kind words and uh, kind welcoming to India. I'm sure it's very exciting to join uh, the Embassy of Israel in New Delhi in this uh, unprecedented times. Um, as you probably know, uh, at the Economic Commission, we focus on promoting uh, mutual trade between India and Israel. Uh, and given the uncertainty of these unprecedented times um, in the way of doing business, we felt that it's only appropriate to bring to the table the most cutting edge players from both sides uh, to share their uh, views and best practices. Um, so a big, first of all, a big thanks to our longstanding partners in AIMA and especially yourself, Reka, and uh, Mr. Signaya, president of AIMA, um, and our longstanding partners in our crowd uh, for your hard work put into this webinar, uh, Lali David and Dan Fischel. Um, and uh, thank you for making this event happen. This couldn't have happened without you. Uh, without further ado, I'll leave the floor to our panelists whose ideas and views I'm excited to be hearing this upcoming and very interesting session. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Natasha Zangin, Councillor, Head of Economic and Commercial Mission, Embassy of Israel, New Delhi. Uh, Ms. Rekha Sethi, Director General, AIMA. Ms. Uh, Lali David, a partner, business development, our crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great pleasure to be with you uh, today at this webinar. Ms. Zangin, it is great to have you in the program. We appreciate your commitment to developing business ties between India and Israel and striving to keep the contact between India and Israeli companies going, even during the pandemic. The two countries have a lot of catching up to do in economic cooperation. And I'm sure that this session would help in taking things forward. Modern India and Israel both were born out of partitions in 1947 by the erstwhile British Empire, but their paths diverged because of geopolitics. However, the two countries have come closer since the end of the Cold War and the proliferation of globalization. In 1992, the trade between the two countries was a mere 200 million US dollars, which has now grown to about $6 billion. And this does not include India's extensive purchase of military equipment from Israel. Though the commercial trade is still dominated by two-way movement of diamonds, there has been substantial increase in the mutual trade in pharma, agriculture, IT, and telecom products and services. Many of the Indian pharma and IT majors are present in Israel directly or through acquisitions. A large number of Israeli firms have invested in India, mainly in agriculture, chemicals, real estate, and security. In a changed world, both India and Israel could help each other make their respective economies bigger and better. India has a big capacity to produce and consume, and Israel has shown a great instinct for technology development. The two countries can complement each other's strengths and cooperate in the global market. Innovation is the key area for cooperation between Indian and Israeli companies. Both countries have huge startup ecosystems, which create an opportunity for joint development of digital technologies and applications. Indian entrepreneurs are good at working the markets, and they are hungry for partnerships that allow them to upgrade technology quickly. Israeli firms excel at rapid adoption and development of the latest technologies, and they can help Indian firms speed up innovations. While Indian and Israeli companies have been collaborating in precision agriculture 
generic pharmaceuticals, military equipment, etc. There is a huge new market for innovations in the healthcare sector. After the COVID shock, India is set to increase its coverage of healthcare through both the government and private investments. And there would be a huge demand for innovative healthcare equipment and technology solutions. India is aiming to develop its manufacturing sector, and that is another potential market for innovations. COVID disruptions have changed minds in India about automation, and there is going to be a lot of innovation in that area. India is not a market for off-the-shelf automation because it is a labor surplus economy with constraints on consumers buying capacity. Frugal innovations, therefore, would be the way to go in India. And that is an area for Indian and Israeli companies to work together. Importantly, innovation is no longer just desirable. After the pervasive disruption of supply chains, work and consumption, innovation has become <clears throat> a clear and present need. <clears throat> a few months of lockdowns have changed attitudes that otherwise would have taken years. Business leaders, are now more willing to commit resources to technology to ensure their revenues do not come to a full stop, even if the normal moment stops. Companies are now willing to spend on technologies that allow them to keep functioning with minimum access to the workplace and workforce. Forced digitization has changed work, ladies and gentlemen, workplace and lifestyles. And the enterprises that have been reluctant or slow to change have been pushed to the margins. New markets have opened up and new customers have been added by the digital rush. Innovation is a necessary attachment of digitalization. The entry barriers are lower in the on, on the online realm and market power shifts from the producer to innovative intermediaries. At the same time, digitalization allows companies to achieve new levels of scale, segmentation and efficiency. In this new business environment, Relentless innovation is essential for creating differentiated value proposition and building defensible competitive advantage. The best way to keep innovating is to partner others, both within and outside one's business ecosystem. While leadership in an industry has the advantage of momentum and resources, but it also imposes fear of mistakes. Sharing risks and rewards of innovation is a better way of achieving a better average in wins than trying to go it alone. Even after the economy has discounted the COVID impact, <clears throat> businesses will have to keep innovating to deal with the churn caused by technological advances, regulatory changes, and new behaviors. A new machine, a new law, a new tax, or a new moral code could upset the best laid business plans. It is never possible to anticipate change clearly or adequately, and a bit of luck is needed to roll the dice correctly. However, not playing the future is not an option. The cost of trying the uncharted is usually lower than the cost of treading the beaten path for too long. Those who innovate may fail, but those who stick to tradition risk total irrelevance. The best way, therefore, to keep winning is to keep changing the game yourself. Therefore, innovate often and innovate a lot. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be here, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm Larry David. I'm a partner uh, and head of business development at our crowd, and I'm pleasure to be here and uh, share a few slides about our crowd. Just a quick introduction. So our crowd is a special kind of investor based in Israel, but with offices globally. Uh, we have more than $1.5 billion committed to the different deals that we bring to the platform. So we are a crowdfunding uh, platform. We invite the crowd to join us in every, every investment that we do. Every investment that we bring to the platform, we invest from our own funds and open it to the crowd. Uh, altogether, we've made more than 220 investments in 23 different funds and four incubators. Uh, the way that it works is actually simple. We, we look at deals. We have a lot of uh, deals coming in from the different sources that we have. We diligence the deals. 
uh, and we negotiate the deal terms and then we open to the crowd to invest with us. The crowd is a diverse crowd. It includes people like yourself, accredited investors, uh, family offices, institutional investors, corporate VCs and others. Uh, if you do invest, this is how your page looks. You have a continuous uh, monitoring of your portfolio of privately held uh, startups uh, from Israel and from uh, globally. This is a snapshot of our portfolio. You can see that it's very much across different sectors uh, with about 60% of the investments are out of Israel and about 40% Globally, we actually do have a very significant investment in India in a company called uh, Zoomcar um, uh, for, uh, for the sharing of, uh, of automotive. Uh, and we have a very strong presence in healthcare, in mobility, in enterprise software. Um, in each of these sectors, we, when we look at our portfolio, we, we recognize an, an, a startup leader in that sector. So, for example, in semiconductor, we have Halo, which is one of the most brilliant companies in Israel in terms of uh, cheap architecture. And this goes along the different uh, sectors, data, AI, digital health, and otherwise. Uh, the company was founded by John Medved uh, and is surrounded uh, with a great team of managers of the different teams and responsibilities within our crowd. And just one minute on the incubators, because this is very unique to us. Uh, the government of Israel um, has this uh, initiative already for 20 something years of supporting early stage startups via government backed incubators. Each incubator has a license. We have four licenses for four different incubators across uh, themes and geographies. This gives us a very strong visibility into the early stage the venture creation stage. We later on invest in these startups uh, if we choose to do so over the platform uh, and later on in later stage deals. These, these are some of our exits. Uh, two of them are IPOs, the best IPOs in 2020 and 2019. 2020 was Lemonade and the New York Stock Exchange, InsureTech company out of Israel. Uh, 2019 was Beyond Meat, uh, a US-based company um, uh, for alternative meat. And uh, we, we've invested in uh, in, in those two companies. Um, the other exits uh, on the screen are by M&A, different acquisitions. We co-invest with many co-investors, uh, leading uh, VCs that invest with us in the same deals, on the same terms, and we maintain excellent relationships with the co-investors and the companies. We're very actively bringing a lot of value to our portfolio companies, utilizing um, a, a very intense uh, strategic network that we have. And you can see the different strategic partners that we have. On the right side are the partners that we have for our incubators, including uh, Reliance uh, from India for our Jerusalem uh, Labs 2 incubator. We have the different co-investors and we have innovation partners. These are all entities that have partnered with us on, on different innovation journey uh, milestones, whether it's looking at technology integration, covering the Israel ecosystem, whether it's looking at co-investment opportunities uh, or other specific initiatives. Uh, yes Bank from India is actually uh, one of these uh, partners. Uh, we also have distribution partners uh, that help us um, uh, distribute these investment opportunities to, to clients across the globe, including uh, reliant uh, private client uh, from India. Uh, Dan is going to speak more about uh, innovation these days, uh, and this was also mentioned uh, before me. But when and and when you look at this slide and you look at how companies perform when they actually uh, spend the attention and resources to innovate, you see that they outperform the market in times of when they invest in times of crisis and the years after. But this will be covered later by then. When we think about innovation in our crowd. We uh, identify two ways for MNCs to focus on innovation. One is via partnering with startups, technology integration, and POCs, and the other is investing in startups. And we have created different ways at our crowd to support companies in their innovation journey. Uh, if it's technology integration, it's typically uh, in the knowledge space, uh, looking at industry, industry reports, um, educational sessions. Engagement is actually it's actually engaging with startups, it's technology integration, it's POCs, uh, and communities networking. It's building your networking, being part of the technology conversation and ecosystem in Israel. We've been working for many years with, uh, with Honda on technology integration, and have seen a lot of success in creating, facilitating and creating significant POCs for, uh, for Honda. Uh, similarly with Halma from the UK, uh, where we facilitated significant POCs and investments for Halma in Israel. When you think about investments, we have different ways for these multinationals to invest with our crowd, whether it's CVC as a service, whether it's creating a dedicated investment vehicle across specific areas of interest, 
or picking and choosing single investments or joining our one of our funds. As I said before, we have 23 different funds. Each of them is funding uh, in different uh, um, times. With GE Ventures, we, we had a very successful co-investment agreement when GE Ventures was still a very active investor. And we had uh, six investments that uh, they have joined us uh, in investing. But I assume everyone can see my screen. We're 15 minutes a bit ahead of schedule, which is great news because I can definitely talk for longer. So welcome again to uh, Innovating Now or Never, where we take a look at what's happening right now uh, in the days of the new normal and how corporations are going to be impacted by it and what entrepreneurs, startups are bringing now to the table. Very soon, we're going to start two panels. The first one is the corporate panel. We're very thrilled to have uh, a roster of amazing uh, speakers, executives from top companies. We have uh, Mr. Pramond Basin, the founder of, of Genpact. We have uh, Ilanit Cabresa, the founder of Dole Ventures. We have David Schwartz from PepsiCo, uh, Neil Ackerman from J&J, &J, and myself, Dan Fischel. I'm vice president of business development at our crowd. After this panel, we're going to switch to an entrepreneur panel. We're going to have Pranjal Sharma, uh, the author of India Automated, interview four of our top portfolio companies, Biocatch, Cryon, Zebra Medical, and Zugano. But before we begin in the panel, I want to ask you whether you are in good company or are you working for a good company? Because at this point, we're already 10 months into the new normal, the so-called new normal. It's pretty clear, and I'm going to make a bold statement, that we're facing a Darwinian moment in corporate history. In the next five to 10 years, we're going to see a redistribution of corporate winners and losers. The winners are the, the, the corporations that will adapt faster to a underlying technological change, a radical technological change, some of which we already feel, some of which is still hidden. The losers are those great corporations that are still too slow to react to change. And there are many of them. Now, there is a, a McKinsey uh, report that shows that published not that long ago that corporations that invest in innovation at times of crisis outperform the S&P 500 by up to 30%, 30%, that's huge. That's data of the 2008 innovative companies that in the, in the 2008 crisis outperformed the S&P index by up to 30%. Now this is super, super critical because even before COVID, the lifespan of company on the S&P 500 index has been decreasing exponentially from 60 years in the 1950s to less than 20 today. Now. There is a little uh, chat uh, box at the uh, at your panel um, at the bottom of the, of the screen. Um, the chat box is designed for you to participate in the conversation. We'd like you to participate. There is a Q&A uh, icon that is designed to just to ask questions to the panelists. So I'd like you just to know this too, uh, because we're going to get back to the uh, to the chat uh, option, and we're going to have some some polls very very soon. Um, so, if you can take a look at the chat and let me know what do you think? Why is have why why the lifespan of S and P five hundred company uh, is decreasing exponentially? How come it's happening? Okay, while well, I let you get uh, guys the time to adjust. Okay, so uh, uh, Ashutosh uh, is saying lack of innovation is one of the uh, unable to adapt to competition. That's that's a great that's a great. So Ajit is saying other good companies are marching ahead. Innovation is creating game changers, says uh, Rajendra. The limit says resistance to change. So it's all true. And thanks for participating. It's all true. The reality is it's happening because of two words, tech disruption, technology disruption. 
Now, technology disruption basically means that uh, a new product has been introduced to market that renders all previous products obsolete. Now, tech disruption on its own is nothing new. It's been with us since the industrial revolution. You know, the, the cars disrupted the horse. What's new is the pace in which it's happening. Tech adoption has never been faster even before COVID. If you take a look at this chart, it basically shows the tech adoption in, in the US over the last 100 years. It took Americans 50 years to adopt electricity in their homes. It took them less than 10 to adopt the smartphone. Now, this was before COVID. What's happening now with these days, and this is yesterday's slide already, it's an exponential acceleration of tech adoption. And we all know the stories about Amazon that's hiring 100,000 employees. And we all know about everyone's buying uh, groceries uh, online, at least in, in Europe and the US. And we all know about Netflix lowering the bandwidth because everyone's home watching movies. But reality is that everything has become digital. Governments, out of the sudden, they're all digital. Banks, insurance companies. How did it happen overnight? How did it happen overnight? Because the technologies was there, the mindset was not there. People were too slow to adopt technology, too slow to adopt change. Now, what's happening now is that we see that uh, the tech adoption, the, the accelerated tech adoption all over the world is reaching new demographics like the elderly. It's changing consumer behaviors from the very, very core. And if you're a corporation, it uh, fuels a shift to the cloud because the, the, uh, the current uh, design of, of IT systems uh, was never designed for work from home. So to the extent that even, and again, this is also yesterday's slide because we all know it by now. The Microsoft CEO said back in April, I think we've seen two years worth of digital transformation happening in two months. Now, does it ever go back? The reality is that history shows us that tech adoption never reverses. So the trend that we already took is not gonna change. And if we're gonna try to qualitatively put what's happening right now on, on this chart, it's a straight line up, the digitization of what's not digital. So this is what every, everyone feels, the, 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 uh, the acceleration of digitization. What people might not feel is automation and acceleration of automation. Now, automation is the process by which humans are replaced by machines. It's been happening for a very long time, and we tend to intuitively think about this process as a straight line. Every year, more humans are replaced by more machines. And this is, ladies and gents, wrong, because it's not a straight line. It happens in spikes. And these spikes are centered around uh, economic recessions. So it happened in 2008, it happened in 2000, and it happened in 1991 when the relative cost of labor goes up because company uh, revenue go down, they simply lay off employees. And who are those employees? These are the, as you can probably imagine, these are the low income uh, routine occupation that can be easily automated. And those employees that have lost their jobs in all previous recessions, but also those that are losing their jobs right now, are being replaced by a mix of technology and highly skilled workers. You can see it in the 2008, 2009 recession, there's been a spike in the demand for, uh, for, for workers that are better experience, sorry, better education, more experience, and most importantly, better computer skills. Now, the automation potential, this is the automation potential of the US market. It's an indicator for a lot of the developed economies is mind blowing. It's on average 46%, it's double digits. Just think about it for a second. The automation potential of the US workforce is double digit, 46%. And this is data from the Brookings Institution uh, in DC, but it's, it's comparable with, with uh, a lot of uh, McKinsey data and, and, um, and plenty of others. So it, it's, and, and take a look, for example, at the, at the top of the list, accommodation and food services. These are exactly the employees that have lost their jobs right now, hotel workers, restaurant workers. Now, I wanna ask you another question and please answer on the chat 
get, get your fingers ready. What's radically different in this recession? Depression, probably. What's different in this depression, radically different in terms of technology compared to all previous three? So take a second to think about it. And I want to see your answers. What do you think is radically different this time? No. So we have, we have a first one. OK, everyone's coming. So we are more connected. So remote working is possible. Very true. Uh, we have social media and exposure. Very true. Because of the pandemic, yes, we have, we're, we're in a recession. Um, but from a technological perspective, there's one thing, there is one thing that enables work from home and enables uh, to be more connected. And we don't feel it just yet because it's very early stage. But that thing is called AI. AI is the technology for the first time that human humanity has that can replace humans, <clears throat> not just in manual labor like before, but also in cognitive skills can replace insurance agents. It can replace, to a certain extent, radiologists in hospital. And you know that type of technology, which is still early stage today, is going to dramatically impact the workforce in years ahead. Uh, AI was uh, just a you know super early stage uh, in in 2008. Uh, was theoretical in 2000 and science fiction in 1991. And the impact on, on, of AI on the corporate landscape in the next five to 10 years is gonna be immense. Now, let's talk about uh, uh, some, some new terms that COVID brings to the table. The first one is acceleration. The second one is transformation. Acceleration is basically the increase of existing technologies that, that it can be used in a certain sector. So let's think about uh, you know, financial services. Uh, out of the sudden, all the banks are digital, but the technologies were already there. They just needed to be adopted. That adoption has been accelerated. On the flip side, we have transformation, is the application of new technologies or repurposing of existing technologies so it can be used in another sector. So sectors that are, are undergoing transformation, for example, think about air travel. They need to transform from regular airport security into biosecurity. It's a completely different ballpark, different ball game. Uh, and this is a way just kind of to think about uh, qualitatively, again, how is your sector affected? Air travel is pretty much up in the right. Online entertainment is pretty much on the left because you know, they're, they're gaining from, uh, from COVID, but there's no real uh, you know, change in, in, in what they need. So there is a quick poll question that I'd like, uh, maybe Elisheva can put on the screen. How is your sector affected? Would it undergo an acceleration of existing technologies like financial services? Would it need to transform into uh, new technologies, maybe both of the above and the combination, or maybe your sector isn't affected at all? So let's wait another three seconds and see the, uh, the results. And now let's see the, the results. Okay. Both of the above combined. So it's a combination. Actually, that's pretty common. Uh, a lot of sectors would need to uh, a little bit of both. OK, so let's move, let's move onwards and let's talk about the innovation. I think by, all, by, by this point, it's pretty clear that we need innovation in order to uh, get post-COVID uh, in one piece. Uh, and there's two types of innovation. There is incremental innovation which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the switch from a, a three uh, a blade razor into a five blade razor. And there is disruptive innovation. But Netflix did to the, to the DVD what Spotify did to the CD and they made them completely obsolete. Now, here's another poll question for you. Uh, and please answer this if you're only working in a corporation, okay? So who are your main competitors? Can we see the, uh, the question now? So corporate executive only, who is your main competitor? If you have to think just about one, who would that be? Another big corporation, SMBs, startups, or none of the above? Who is your main competitor? Let's give it another three seconds and see the results. And let's see the results. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Startups, nice. Okay, okay. So I'll tell you why I'm asking this. Um, I'm asking this because if you said corporation, it means that you're thinking in terms of incremental innovation. Um, disruptive innovation never comes from large corporations. That's the, that's the reality. Very rarely it does. Uh, corporations, they compete between themselves on incremental innovation. <clears throat> I'm sorry. If you said startups, it means you're thinking in terms of disruptive innovation, because this is the real, uh, these are the real disruptors in our economy for the past 30 years. They're very, very hard to see because there are so many and they're very, very tiny. And they specialize in just one thing and that one thing they do really, really well. Um, and these tiny things are called startups and as a group, they go after every and single line of business of a large corporation. Uh, if you're uh, a bank, you have startups that go after, um, you know, loans and mortgages and, and credits and uh, SMBs, you name it. If you're an insurance company, they replace agents with bots like our portfolio company, Lemonade. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because if we're looking uh, at the last 10 years, we don't even have to look at ancient history. We can see that technology has transformed our economy from the very, very core. If we're looking at 2008, at the list of top 10 publicly traded companies by market cap, only two are technology companies. That's Apple and Microsoft. If you're looking at the same list, fast forward 10 years, the top seven are technology companies. Seven of the top 10 are technology companies. And if you're looking at taking a closer look at that list, you find out that these big companies that are, you know, have more influence on our day-to-day -day lives than probably your own government, they have been startups just yesterday. They're on average 28 years old. It's insane. And when number seven in the list, uh, Warren Buffett is selling all of his uh, shares in, in uh, airlines, taking a huge loss, these companies for the third quarter in a row in a time of a pandemic are beating analyst expectations. How is it possible? How is it possible that during the pandemic, the Israeli investment, I'm sorry, the investments in Israeli startups is in a record high? in Q3, but it's the same thing throughout the year. How is it possible? And I'll tell you why it's possible, because the only vaccine to COVID is technology. And I'm not talking about the actual vaccine to the disease, like the mRNA, there's also a lot of technology there. I'm just talking about simple, everyday technology that keeps our economy going. And what do we need to keep our economy going? We need a proper internet speed, we all have it. We need a, a mobile data network that doesn't crash, we all have it. We, we need software like this one uh, to be able to connect and work remotely. We need software to send our kids to school. We need even like a, a proper home entertainment. We don't have to go to, you know, uh, rent DVDs. This type of technology keeps our economy going. Now, can you imagine what were to happen if COVID were to strike in, in 2008? Definitely no, no Zoom in 2008, just Skype, not, not the most reliable even then. Can you imagine what would have happened if COVID were to strike in 1991? No internet. Probably two, way, two things would have happened. You know, either we would be you know, forced to stay home and, and starve in the West, you know, uh, because you, know, you cannot go out. It's probably not an option. Or you would be forced to go and work and, and pay a much higher toll in human lives. So innovation is key in order to uh, outperform competition at the time of crisis and startups are by far the biggest innovators in the past 30 years. We feel it, maybe now we just, we take it for granted with Google and Facebook, at least they've always been there, but no, they have never always, never happened that there's, there's, there, they haven't been there. Just think about just the last 10 years, 10 years ago, probably not too much of Facebook. You know, Google didn't take such a, a big part in your life, knowingly or not, it's all recent. And I'd like to discuss this with our esteemed panelists. So once again, uh, is Pramond uh, here? Maybe you can all turn your cameras, turn on your cameras. The host has to turn it on. 
the host. Okay, so uh, maybe Elisheva can turn on the uh, the cameras for our esteemed panelists. Okay, now we can see. I can see Pramod. Pramod, maybe we can start with you, and then we can switch to um, to uh, David, Neil, and uh, Ilanit. I hope you can um, manage the you know the technical uh, aspect of Zoom. I'm, I'm sure you can. Pramod. <laughs> Uh, Pramod, you are, um, uh, you know, uh, an the business figure in, in India. You founded uh, an IPO, the Genpact, uh, a business process uh, outsource uh, company. Um, I'm, I probably, you know, didn't do a good job articulating what's really happening now in India in terms of the, the big changes that COVID is bringing uh, now and in the future. I'm just wondering, maybe you can share with the audience your perspective, innovation at times of crisis. Sure, happily then, and thank you for having me here and uh, well, really appreciate being part of this wonderful panel. Loved listening to you earlier, Dan, on all the points you were making about innovation and disruption. So India's getting, as you might expect, both, both innovation and disruption happening at the same time. Um, we are mainly struggling with COVID because of our population, because of the mass of our people, uh, because you know Western notions like social distancing. I wish those same people would come here and explain how that should happen in a in a small market or a village in India. You know some of these are laughable concepts, um, and so we have to find our own solutions. Um, so India is very good at some things and equally bad at many things. Uh, so uh, at, at, at some things. Um, so what has happened over the last few years is exactly what you might expect, especially during these COVID times. Digitization has accelerated by years, probably more than in most countries because there was such a large gap, such a large gap in access to broadband adoption of technology, adoption of e-commerce. Um, it's also been driven, if I may say, with a lot of pride by what I would call Indian ingenuity. Um, so every restaurant has become a delivery takeout place. They don't shut down. They've all become delivery guys. Every little grocery store, I have my local grocery store here. He has a stall on the road here, typical Indian style, right? He has a little card and he hands it to me and he says, order on the phone. I'll have it packed for you. I'll put it in the back of your car. You don't have to come near the shop. And he's just to stand on the side of the road and he's innovated using all the technology and tools he has around with him. We were able to, in Delhi, uh, using platforms um, of which we created marketplaces which connected uh, people who were cooking food to people who were distributing food we were distributing, I mean, the government here in Delhi was distributing something like 700,000 meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we got that done in a matter of three weeks, right? So, um, you know, these are things that India uh, excels at in a time of crisis when it really comes to the fore. And we're still continuing to do it. And how was that done? By piecing together very quickly buyers and sellers, by co-opting all the delivery people that you have for food, uh, around the world and those companies like Zomato, et cetera, here stepped up and were able to help. More than that, it has accelerated digitization as, you, as you've talked about it, Dan, in India. We have a long ways to go. Broadband is very patchy. Um, it has created problems for us in terms of, you know, the people who have good broadband have accelerated faster and the people who don't have slipped further behind. So inequality, widens uh, availability of education for richer um, kids is obviously easier on broadband than it is for poorer kids who don't have good broadband access, mobile phone access. All of those things have happened. But at the same time, other things have happened which are remarkable. You know, health, the issues around health around this world are going to be solved by tech, as you said, by technology. It's not going to be solved by more doctors, more hospitals, et cetera, et cetera, because that's a, such a slow process and it will die in time. It won't die, of, sorry, I shouldn't say that, but it, it is bound to not succeed the way healthcare should succeed. Everybody should have access to healthcare. So now suddenly remote diagnostics, delivery of medicines, 
access to doctors, reaching out to the remotest place by scooter. I work with an NGO which has people who go on foot with backpacks um, to the remotest villages where you can only get there by five hours of walking. But with a camera and a smartphone um, and some very basic diagnostics, we can reach all those, all those people can reach hospital. So healthcare will get transformed in my view. Education, clearly. So every college, every school has quickly pivoted to go online as it has done all over the world. And that education is now available to many more people than it would have been. And so what we're trying to do in our own ways to say that those schools which were private and very sacrosanct, how can we expand that education and allow it to be accessible for many, many more people across India? And that will become a sea change. Delivery of food, every retailer, every service, comp service person has really trans tried to transform themselves. Everyone delivers food, everyone provides you whatever service you need. We are eating some of the best food I have eaten in Delhi for a long time. <laughs> it's a bit like in New York, you know, you get amazing food. All these restaurants are delivering amazing food to you. So that has helped. I think in other areas also, there's been major strides that have been made in the areas of governance, in the areas of, you know, we have Aadhaar, the, the, the unique ID system where a billion people in a very short period of time at very low cost are now enrolled with a biometric card each one of us have. So in terms of expansion of bank accounts that has changed, I can go on. What I would say is a couple of things and then I'll turn it back to you. One, in my view, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all of these things are always opportunities. Technology has always created opportunity. Yes, there will be temporary disruption, but I actually think it will disrupt the lowest food chain areas where the work is inhumane. It will take over, it'll bring humane jobs, it'll bring humanity into jobs, as, I, as I've been saying. It will create more jobs. We need to create more jobs and our startup scene as you know, is extremely vibrant. Uh, we're the third largest country in the world with startups. Um, Israel has shown us the way in many, many ways. I want to talk to you about that separately as to what we're trying to do with various states and how we would love to co-opt Israel there. Um, and these startups are finding, as you said, very unique solutions. And I think they're now bursting as people sit at home, they have more power and software and technology helps us, helps them transform every area of industry they look at. In the past, I would have said India's adoption of technology has been poor, probably in the core industries, you know, steel, automotive, lots of those kinds of things. That has all gone out by the window. Everyone is translated, everyone is pivoted quickly. Um, our economy is in doldrums because of the scale of our lockdowns. But I do believe the benefit of all of this is that we will come out of it very fast and very sharply. I'll turn it back to you, Dan. So I, I think what, what I'm taking, I, I, I find it super interesting what you're saying that AI would actually improve uh, the, you know, the uh, work conditions in India would actually create more jobs. And, and this is, uh, and I'd love to hear also maybe uh, the, the other panelists, their, their uh, opinions, because you know, I'm, uh, intuitively you, you tend to think about AI as actually um, uh, impairing the, the lower paid positions, you know, they're, they're, they're basically, you know, uh, turning them jobless uh, because all of this kind of routine occupation can be easily automated. So I would love to um, ask the other panelists about this, but before maybe we uh, approach uh, David uh, Schwartz from PepsiCo, Neil Ackerman from, from j and It's a question for both of you. Maybe you can share with us, you work for mega corporations. Um, how does COVID impacted um, your business, again, from a technological perspective, what do you see uh, are the, the main differences? Neil, should I go first? Then I'll pass it to you. As, uh, so COVID has impacted all of us, as you said. And for us, similar to how you started then and how the, the conference started, our CEO has been pretty clear. It's about being faster, stronger, and better in how we test and adopt different solutions. So first, it's a cultural mindset and just accelerating a journey that's already been in motion, like so many areas of technology. I think what might be interesting is share a few areas specifically that are, are impacting PepsiCo um, and the market as, we, as we're experiencing these shifts. One of them is in digital marketing. So a few examples. 
personalization at scale. There are so many um, advertisements and way of connecting with people, but now with so many people at home and in different environments, how do we connect two people in the right way that we could be relevant um, and at the right time? Another example is gaming. There was such high adoption of gaming pre-COVID, but this accelerated the journey of gaming and adoption of gaming. How do we stay relevant and integrate or be part of these experiences? Um, just given that is where the market is shifting. And then sports marketing. We see all the games with the backgrounds now of uh, empty stands. It's integrating now the live sport with the personal experience, so the digital experience. So these are just a few examples of technologies and experiences pivoting with the new environment. I'd like to take just uh, one second to um, ask the, uh, our audience uh, to ask questions. This is an interactive session. If you're not participating, uh, it's like watching a recording. So just go watch the, the recording. Uh, please, uh, there is a little Q&A uh, uh, icon at the bottom of your screen. Press it, ask questions so we can uh, we can answer them. Actually, I, I have prepared exactly three questions, so it's all up to you guys. Um, Neil. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so, you know, Johnson & Johnson has continued to, uh, you know, be at the forefront of innovation, especially in healthcare. Um, for those of you who don't know, Johnson & Johnson is the world's largest pharmaceutical, uh, the world's largest medical device company. Um, and has a very robust consumer products uh, group led by its own brand, Johnson & Johnson Baby. Um, uh, together, I, I would say that our mission has been that, and what we tell people is no one has exclusivity on good ideas. And so our focus because of COVID is, uh, is really uh, focused very heavily besides the vaccine um, on the supply chain of healthcare. Um, as was said earlier, we have a lot of digital healthcare. We have a lot of investments in robotics and surgery and surgeries. Um, uh, we're in the leading edge of that kind of science. Um, and of course we have many vaccines that come out uh, recently Ebola as an example. Um, but right now uh, we're focused on three areas. The first one is track and trace. Uh, one of our most important things we need to do is understand where the vaccines are, where they've been, what the temperature is, where they're being made, where they're going. So track and trace in real time is a very serious thing. They're very easy when it's one country, very hard when it's 200 countries. Second thing we focus on is the prediction and magic of demand. Um, it's not good enough anymore to just make a forecast and say it's wrong. Now your forecast has to be even more accurate. It has to be store level, SKU level, hospital level, surgery level. You don't have the, you don't have the room to bring in all these surgery kits. You're not sure what you're going to use in a surgery. You have to be more precise because people die. And then the third one that we're focused on is intelligent automation. Yes, there's no doubt that artificial intelligence and machine learning is part of the innovative ecosystem. j and has been doing this many years. The big difference now is we focus on what can we automate intelligently and then upskill some employees to do different roles of innovation with the company. Those are being focused on, and I'm very happy to take questions and be part of the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Now we have a question um, from the audience that is a great segue to uh, Ilanit. Uh, the, so uh, Nagarajan, uh, and I, I apologize if I don't pronounce the name properly, but uh, is, is asking, what about innovation in agricultural products? Um, now automation digitization is more focused on service. So uh, Ilanid, why, why don't you quickly just uh, introduce yourself, what you're doing and, and talk a bit about innovation in agricultural products. Right, well, what a beautiful question right in time. Um, so hi, my name is Ilanid. I've been in the innovation sector for about 20 years. So all of my career has to do with innovation. 
And what I do is I build innovation units, innovation and slash and slash and slash venturing uh, division within uh, multinationals. I did that for Nestle. I did that just recently. Did uh, completed a project for Dol Dol Asia Holdings. So one is a uh, two of them are multinationals. One is uh, from Switzerland, the European headquarter. The second one is Singapore, so Asia headquarter. And the third one, which I'm doing now, is uh, again another multinational uh, in uh, with European headquarter. Um, so this is this has been my focus, and the industry that I'm working in is the agri food industry. So across the supply chain, from uh, from farm uh, from farm to fork. And uh, what we what we see now in this, uh, they say how COVID has impacted this industry is really a massive acceleration of uh, of technology implementation. Um, and I will mention a couple of uh, areas. Um, um, I, I think that the most important um, uh, connection that COVID has created is the connection between people's health, planet health and food or in agricultural products. So with, this has created really a, a change in the mindset of corporations because we knew already that, this, that there is a link. We knew already that there is a need to accelerate innovation in, those, uh, in, in, in this industry. But the, the, the state of mind was really very, very different. And what I've seen uh, now uh, in, in the past uh, almost a year is really a rush. Uh, toward the supply chain technologies. It's still, it's, it's, it is still in the area of digitization because uh, the agriculture industry or the agri-food industry is the less digitized economy ever. So we need to close the gap very, very fast. And I had, as I said, the, the, the pleasure, the honor to work with both Indian uh, startups and Israeli startups uh, in Telolab and Cropin from the Indian side and Fruitspec and Clary Fruit from the Israeli side. Uh, all of them are very, very good, uh, good companies which help uh, to digitize parts of the supply chain, whether it's pre-harvest, both for harvest, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really the first area. The, the, the second area is the area of nutrition, um, uh, which was mentioned also before by, by, by Pramon, uh, 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 the needs of, uh, uh, of a healthier uh, products. And definitely in Asia, you feel it uh, even more. And, um, and therefore in the area of nutrition, we were looking at uh, from one side, regenerative agriculture and crops, uh, uh, different types of, uh, of, of crops technologies, but also at, at processing, how we process uh, fruits, how we process, uh, process agriculture uh, products in order to still uh, save or maintain the nutritional value of products, uh, how we move from uh, the cooking technologies, which are at high temperature and kill all the goodness that are in the in our in our products in our processed products, and do this in lower temperature to maintain um, uh, good vitamins uh, and and so and so on. And we see also in the area of nutrition and food also. Um, um, a, a move towards uh, plant-based proteins uh, and uh, healthier proteins that has to do both with uh, both with uh, sustainability but also the health of the people. So I think if you look at COVID, the connection in the three between those three elements in the system, people, planet, and food, then you see lots of new uh, new opportunities, lots of needs. Uh, across the uh, across the value chain, but where this is uh, where the agriculture agri food industry is operating in. Thanks, Ilanit. So um, we've heard from Pramod, from David, from Neil, and from you. And now I want to take a step back and go to the title of this uh, a webinar. Actually, it's a it's a mega webinar. It's it's a it's a long one. Um, innovating now or never. And we were talking about the decreasing lifespan of, of corporations on the S&P 500 index. By the way, it doesn't mean corporations die. It means they're simply being kicked out of the index because they are less relevant. And we'll be, ta be talking about disruption. So what's your uh, perspective on corporate innovation, especially at the time of a cataclysmic uh, crisis like, like we're facing? What is the right way forward and we're speaking generally for a corporation in order to uh, re-emerge on the other side much stronger. And how are startups, maybe that's a hint, 
uh, how, how startups are connected with it? It's an open question. And by the way, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, I urge the audience to keep asking questions. I see that we're already getting some really good ones. Please continue asking questions. The, 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 you know, this is for you guys. So Neil, I think you, you are right um, Yeah, so um, uh, for those of you who don't know, J&J &J, um, continues to invest and be very involved in corporate venture capital. Uh, this year we were, I think we were six or seven largest uh, CVC uh, globally. We continue to focus our work uh, also with startups. Um, what, the reason why is because um, startups tend to have a very strong uh, niche capability that was mentioned earlier, really go all out to, to win. Um, and they're very good, especially in particular markets such as uh, Israel as an example. They have a strong customer focus. This is why they have over 40 unicorns just out of Israel. So they know what uh, customers want. Um, and so, yeah, that has been our approach. We do partner with them uh, all day, every day. Uh, we've been very active within that community. Uh, and overall, uh, those, that's what we look for, um, uh, for basically culture capability uh, and a customer focus when we partner up with them. Uh, thanks for that question. David, please. I think it's a great question. And Dan, the market is changing, but there are some elements that also stability is really critical. So from seed to shelf, from being one of the largest snack companies in the world, and over a billion people consume our products a day, 23 brands with over a billion dollars of sales. It's big and scale matters. It's really about stability from seed to shelf, where the startups help is making us faster, stronger, and better at every one of those steps from, from the potatoes in the ground to the manufacturing all the way to delivery, which almost touches on one of the questions. It's about knowing where to put the product, where to sell the product, how to sell it, um, so we could have the right product at the right place at the right time and make it accessible to as many people as possible to get those moments of pleasure and joy um, with the different products PepsiCo sells from a snack to a drink. So I think there, there are major changes, but it's not just about pivoting to changing the world. It's also about making what has been so great in the world even better and more efficient. And startups are a huge enabler for that. You know, I've, I've, I've worked for large corporations in my past and I've worked for some, some um, very successful startups. I was very, very lucky. Um, and I can tell you, uh, these are two completely different creatures. There's one that is very agile, um, very quick, very hungry. That's the startup, very creative. And there's the, on the, on the flip side, a, an entity that is the complete mirror image. Slow, um, you know, lots of decision makers, um, not necessarily as agile, uh, not necessarily as creative, um, but on the other hand, strong, you know, big, uh, big access to, to uh, global markets. We're talking about the relationship between a startup and a corporation. Um, and this uh, kind of marriage is not always, or always working. Actually, most POCs, proof of concept that large corporations uh, do with startups, the, the vast majority of them tend to fail because of the human factor, mostly it's cultural issues. So I'm just wondering if, if uh, you guys have any tips for successful corporate startup collaboration. I would, be, I would be happy to chime in here and also connect it to the previous question. I think the topic is about how a company, how a corporate is building its innovation portfolio, its innovation strategy and balancing between teams and processes and expectations between internal innovation and venturing slash open innovation, CVC type of, uh, uh, the, the type of that, that it has to do with interaction with startups. Um, any corporation that is uh, work that needs innovation and want to establish innovation has to establish its innovation strategy and, and, and needs to understand that internal innovation is limited. It's limited in growth, but it's still very important because most of the cash cows will come from um, uh, are still existing uh, in, within, the, uh, within the internal innovation capability. So usually if you set up a good uh, innovation division and in process and 
team and KPIs and all of that, then you can expect two to three uh, percent growth, uh, annual growth. And if you're wonderful, uh, excelling and, uh, and a super professional, then you will from time to time you will reach also six percent growth uh, uh, from year once in a while. Um, Taking that, it, that into consideration, there is the understanding that you have to work with the external uh, uh, entities and with the opportunities which are out there if you want to develop uh, growth strategies which are which going beyond this, those numbers, which can bring you into new type of uh, 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 new, new type of, bis of, of businesses, new type of ventures and new types of opportunities. And hence, this is how you should start and develop your capabilities to work with the outside world. However, as you've been saying, uh, this is very, uh, very difficult. Uh, these are very difficult relationships, but there's a way to do that. And from my, uh, from my experience, and I'm sure that from David's experience as well, because we've been sharing uh, those learnings uh, uh, along, uh, along our careers, is that there is a way to do that. And the way to do that is to really structure a good process uh, from the beginning to an, to an end and to develop this mechanism of interaction with people and to uh, train people that can do that, that can bridge between the cultures, that can bridge between the mindsets. Um, just, just, you know, just small, uh, small tips. Um, if you wanna do a POC, please make it uh, a, a time, in, in a time constraint. If you cannot start, uh, you cannot start a POC with a company and then think, okay, let's, let's evolve and see when it, this is ending. Please limit it to, uh, uh, I like to limit it to eight to 12 weeks per, per, per POC. Or if you want to work uh, with, with startups, please do, de please develop a very rigorous mechanism to benchmark, to screen uh, those opportunities and to align them, to align what the startup is doing with the business priorities of the, of the company. So there is a knowledge how to do that. However, the, this knowledge is not that accepted accessible for both for both sides it's type of a new knowledge now in the ecosystem thanks promo you wanted to say something yes a whole bunch of stuff on this yeah. <laughs> and i'll come from a different so place hand, so i thought probably you wanna go ahead thank <laughs> and i'll come from a slightly different place if i may look i think both have to exist right i mean i don't see banks and others shaking in their knees from startups and their death has been predicted for decades, right? Um, I don't see many other industries shaking because the next startup is gonna take over. I think both exist in different parts. They both play their ro roles. They both do well. Innovation has a lot to do with the culture. You know, I worked with General Electric for 25 years under the Jack Welch era at that time. And look what's happened to the company. It's dissolved completely almost. But in those days, we used to grow at 15% a year, average annual growth rate for 15 years. And we were the largest non-bank finance company in the world. And so it was all about culture. We had a culture of entrepreneurship. We went out and bought companies. We bought assets. We took risks and risk-taking. And I think that works. I think if you look in India, for instance, there are many banks, you know, for a bank in India, HDFC Bank, which is a, one of the largest private sector bank currently, I think it's market cap, I'll probably get this wrong, is about $80 billion, um, grows at 25% a year average annual growth rate for the last 15 years, right? So a lot of it is, it's, it's not just about startups, it's just the difference to me now is that we are all working together more and more. Earlier, you know, a multinational, I know how people would complain even with the GenPAC that it was very hard for a startup to make any inroads and partner with us. And now all of us are learning that we don't have all the brains. The startups are very good. They're very smart. They can add lots of pieces along the way. But if you see the transformation that Microsoft has gone through with Satya Nadella, it's quite remarkable from a company which was getting hurt at one time to a company which is now, you know, a trillion and a half dollars in market cap. That's been a remarkable shift. Similarly, I would talk about Cisco. So I think there are examples, great examples everywhere. They're all worth looking at. I think artificial intelligence, automation really hasn't reached core industry yet, IoT, et cetera, to the extent it could. It hasn't affected manufacturing processes yet. It hasn't affected um, core services of many companies as much as it could yet, but it will. 
And I think that's where the ideas and the competitive edge that startups create, which when you are in a multinational, you're looking around the shoulder all the time and saying, when is this guy going to come after me? It keeps you on your edge and keeps you innovating. The last thing I would say, is, unfortunately, major multinationals are built for defense. They're not built for offense. A large part of those teams are built to protect their boundaries, protect their turfs, protect the processes, keep internal controls, et cetera. They have many accountants. I'm an accountant, uh, so I can say this. Accountants are the depth of innovation, right? They need an answer for every investment. How do you, my, when I'm building Genpact as an outsourced company, I remember going to my boss, he said at GE, and it was a captive, and he said to me, he said, give me a business plan. I gave him a blank piece of paper. I said, I'll put whatever you like. What do you want it to show? You want it to show it makes a loss, it makes money, it profit, break in, whatever you want to show, I'll show it. I can only promise you it will be wrong, right? So companies also have to transform, and I think they're learning to do that. And watching the agility of the Amazons or the Microsoft, I think, is a, as important a lesson as it is to watch the agility of startups. So both must coexist. I'm not sure it's one or other. That's great. Uh, that's that's a great insight uh, from what I, I actually want to along these lines. I want to speak with with ask David uh, a question. You you uh, you manage the uh, innovation for for PepsiCo. We're actually based in an office not very far from where I'm sitting right now. Actually, on the other side. <laughs> I don't think you're here though. Um, how do you select the the startups that uh, PepsiCo works with? Uh, and, and just to, just to uh, and just to remind the audience that we're going to hear from the startups, we're going to hear from the entrepreneurs in just a few minutes. Please, David. Great question, Dan. And I'll try to link it to some of the Q and A questions that are popping up. Yeah, there's so many startups out there. It's overwhelming. To put it in the corporate shoes, it is an overwhelming number of companies out there. And the amount of emails I get a day, I sometimes just open my email, let my children just watch, just it keeps going and going with more. I have the best solution. If PepsiCo only adopted this, you will save the planet, which is, and many of them are, are phenomenal, but many of them are very similar. And therefore there are two key words that we look at when we're looking at different startups and innovation. First is relevance and second is differentiation. So how relevant is this solution to what PepsiCo needs? And we have a clear strategy. We're not articulating it on a large forum, but we have specific areas of things we're trying to solve. The second is, it's how differentiated is that company, that startup from the X number of other startups and companies that do something very similar. And what we're really looking for is a company that's relevant to our business needs and differentiated with a deeper tech or a unique solution to solve that problem rel relative to all the others in, in that space. So a question for, for everyone, any do's and don'ts for, for startups uh, trying to reach out to work with corporations? Do's is, uh, if I may say this, uh, as having sat on both sides, do is be, <laughs> doing is something that they do naturally already, which is be very persistent. You know, you have to break down the walls of these big companies. Uh, our walls are pretty high. Uh, you know, our defensive moats are very high. It's hard to get through, hard to get to the right person. But you've got to be one, very, very persistent. Two, I think both startups and big companies, by the way, both have to sit in the other person's shoes. You have to imagine from life in terms of how the big company, because I get a lot of startups coming to me and saying, we've got great ideas, but nobody's listening to us. And I'm saying, well, have you sat on the other side? of his or her shoes and imagine why they aren't listening to you. Maybe it's not as relevant. Maybe the priorities are different. Maybe they can't do it today. All of those things. And I think both sides need a better mechanism of understanding. And lastly, I think I, I would say, you know, the, 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 the don't do's is a lot of both sides tend to look at each other and say, well, you don't know what you're talking about or you don't know my issues and you don't know my priority. And I think that just is counterproductive, whereas a better understanding of both will lead to much better partnerships, um, as opposed to just saying, you know, those guys are idiots, they don't know what they're doing, they're slow and they're soft. Well, fine, if you think they're so soft, why are you here? Why don't you go and do it somewhere else, you know? <laughs> okay. So I wanna go to the, um, to the questions from the Q&A. And uh, I've seen something we, we touched just before uh, about AI um, and the, the impact on the, on, on the workforce. So 
so super relevant for corporations, but also uh, something we were all employees in, on, on some, some way or, or, or the other. I definitely work for my wife. So, um, so, the, so Sanjay is asking, um, given the income of people decreased or even vanished, how can AI help to bring affordable products and services to consumers? Um, what, would that, what, what would the answer be here, uh, Pramod? I think, you know, what AI and technology are doing is opening up markets, for instance, in a country like India, which were never open earlier. Give you two examples. You know, we only have 20 million credit cards in a country of a billion people. Why? Because we couldn't reach the people. Now we can reach them. So now suddenly you're going to see that expand. We only had whatever, 200 million bank accounts. Now we have 500 million bank accounts. All of these then create more jobs, more spending, healthcare. We need 100,000 healthcare assistants to go out and reach the villages and work from there and deliver remote diagnostic capabilities to doctors working in hospitals who can diagnose those patients. These are new jobs. They haven't existed in the past. Mm -hmm. Uber can now move into the smaller towns and villages and provide not Uber, but Uber on two wheelers, on three wheelers, things like that. These are all new jobs because the gaps in a country like India are so, so significant. And it applies across the board. Imagine education, being able as a small school teacher in a small village, in a small school, being able to broadcast your teaching to many other students from around that area who otherwise would have a one hour walk to school. So you can see the impact, agriculture, distribution of agriculture, monetizing that, giving it a platform, allowing it to be sold to whoever wants it versus the marketplaces which are very captive today and captured by politics, et cetera. All of these will create, in my view, a plethora of new jobs, which I really think can change India's future trajectory. So I'd like to open the same questions to, to the panelists. How will AI uh, impact the workforce in the next five to 10 years? For us, we're hoping that uh, the utilization of intelligent automation will uh, do things that customers, patients love, which is continue to drive costs down. No one wakes up and says, I want to pay a lot more today. So we're hoping that happens. Two, uh, it will allow us to be even more efficient with the, what we produce in our selection. And because no one wakes up and says, I want to allow us to not only be personalized, but provide. And third, the use of AI will be a more efficient supply chain, which will improve what the third thing, which customers and patients and doctors and hospitals want, which is please give me more convenience and make it easier for me. And so um, if you make sure that when people wake up, that you're not giving them higher prices, less choices, and more friction, then um, I guess I'll sign up to the IA train because that train is going to reduce prices, give more selection, and make it easier to operate. That's the way we kind of look at it. And as many note, uh, J&J has used uh, lots of um, IA, we call it intelligent automation across our enterprise. And in those cases, We've been able to upskill employees to focus on different areas within the company, uh, being that we have consumer products, medical devices, vision care, and pharmaceutical. Uh, there's no lack of work uh, for the healthcare company. Uh, and you know we continue to find ways to innovate and try to make sure that we're uh, meeting the expectations of our shareholders. Uh, I hope that answers part of the question. Sure, it does. Uh, I uh, we're we're just uh, we have just uh, five minutes left, uh, and I want to do something. I wasn't preparing you for this guy for, for this. Uh, um, so uh, don't be angry at me. Um, but we have some of the you know top minds in, in corporate innovation and entrepreneurship uh, here on this panel, and I'd like actually to open the uh, give you the mic to ask yourselves some questions. So if someone wants to ask another panelist a question, I would love to hear that. And I'm sorry, guys, I didn't prepare you for this. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Please. 
And I'd love to uh, ask uh, Ilani a question, please, about agriculture and innovation and how can we translate that to India? You have so many, so many um, areas where you can work, so many areas where we can look And this for you also, Dan. How do you bring them to India much faster? You know, right now it's a very slow courtship. We chat, we talk, we do it slowly. Whereas the need is huge and the opportunity is huge. So I'd, it's a very open-ended question. How can we really accelerate this partnership? It's very... Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Challenge taken. Um, I will try to think fast. Um, I would say I, this is uh, an ecosystem effort in order to accelerate the, the, the offer. We, 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 we have a good experience in Israel in building the ecosystem and making changes fast thanks to collaboration between the different parts of the ecosystem. So working in Asia now in the past year and a half, I see the need, I understand the need, um, I see the potential also, and I see how new technologies are coming in, but definitely India has specifically in the area of agriculture, different needs, uh, smallholder farms and um, uh, specific climate, specific nutrition needs and, then, and, and so on. So I think it's about building a task force um, it could be, it doesn't matter who's initiating that. It could be people, it could be government, it could be uh, corporates, uh, but there has to be uh, someone that is taking the lead and building an ecosystem around it. A uh, uh, few types of people uh, or, or, or leaders that can make the change. Start small, but just start doing. And that's the most important. Uh, that's the most important part. Um, I I've seen quite as I said before quite uh, quite a good companies in the area of agriculture technologies in India, and I've seen the same in Israel. Uh, so I think it's about creating this task force and starting to do, and then it will grow by itself. Ramad, I would add one thing to that. Leverage the corporates. Uh, exactly. We're piloting Israeli startups in India um, in what we're doing. PepsiCo, we're, we're quite significant in agriculture um, or partnering with farms and farmers all around the world. The corporates have a good understanding of the need and they could help bridge that gap um, to test things in both markets. I would also good. add to corporates uh, a sponsoring mechanism, a bank, a government to help support uh, uh, pilots, which corporates can, uh, can help uh, contextualize technologies in, 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 in the land. It's it's like so it, it's becoming a work it's becoming a work uh, discussion type of a brainstorm uh, group discussion. <laughs> yep. Well, we'll get stuff. The done. last piece. Appreciate is, that. I would really I would align your corporates and your uh, capital with corporates uh, with academics. Uh, we've had great success, uh, not you know related in of course pharma and med device but it would be not be a very different model for agri, ag, agri-finance or agribusiness. Um, we, we put our money with academia. Uh, this influences the most innovative minds to come together. Uh, and then we, of course, startups are brought out from there and it influences uh, cultures globally. And they tend to have universities that share across countries and states within India. So we've done that in the past with great success and it's cheap. It's so wonderful. I think your, your questions about how to bring Israeli uh, startups to India is a great segue for our next panel uh, because all the startups we're gonna meet now uh, have either interest in India or actually uh, operations in India. I'd like to thank uh, Ilanit Kobesa, Neil Ackerman, David Schwartz, and Pramod Basin for your insights today. Thank you very much. We're going to switch now to Pranjal Sharma. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a great panel to follow uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what are the key points for India and Israel to look at the, the great dialogue between large companies and, and uh, smaller companies, startups. Uh, this session is really going to be about uh, crisis in, in innovation, especially among startups. And I think we have four very exciting companies uh, who are going to talk about what, what has happened in their lives. I think the key issue when you're looking at crisis and in innovation is that if you're a large company, perhaps you're not agile, but you have a lot of resources to be able to manage 
Uh, and this is the kind of crisis which uh, very few people have experienced before. Uh, if you're a smaller company, a startup based completely in technology, then your ability to deal with the situation is much better. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, not as much resources. Uh, so, you know, it's there is a balance on both sides. So what we plan to do in this session is going to, I'm going to request each of our uh, speakers uh, to a, introduce themselves a little bit in terms of uh, what they do. Uh, and, and the second part of their, their intervention uh, and their thought uh, would be about what they did during the last few months uh, since the uh, pandemic began. Uh, how did they cope with the challenges? Did they see any opportunities which they were able to make the most of? Did they end up doing something which they never thought? Did, was there a, a you know 180 degree shift in their perspective of what the market is? Did the market suddenly say that, well, we don't want what you were offering, but this is what is going to happen? Or in many companies which we have seen uh, in India and, and across the world as well, that the milestones that they wanted to achieve in three to six months, or sorry, you know, 12 to 18 months somehow got accelerated and everybody said, well, if you're offering cloud-based services, for instance, we would like it right now because obviously we cannot work with the old old structures uh, before. So I'm going to begin by inviting Harald Tayeb, CEO of Cryon, to, to begin uh, and request him to, you know, uh, introduce himself and his company for a couple of minutes and then take the next three or four minutes to talk about uh, his own journey in the last few months. So uh, anyway, so Crown is an RPA company. Uh, you know, I always like to uh, call Crown an RPA plus plus company. Uh, we have a technology and, you know, for those that are not familiar with the RPA, we have a technology that can create, maintain uh, an automation scenario. A, work, a virtual worker that can do anything that user can do, that human can do, uh, and sometimes much, much beyond. So as you can see, the customers that we have are almost from any vertical. It can be banking like uh, uh, HSBC, Sberbank, TCF Bank, insurance companies, many telcos. And I think that, you know, um, the core technology or the innovation that we have within our product came from the idea that beside of the attended automation, which is a product that can work on your machine and help you, guide you through your day-to-day -day job and make you more productive, we have the unattended behind the scene that can reduce cost dramatically and can help you with getting more and more revenue. And, but Crown also deliver a unique technology that changed the RPA market, which is the process discovery. And that's you know, one part of the innovation, the ability to identify, to map the automation prior to the execution side, and then reduce the total cost of ownership by up to uh, 80%. And that's, that's dramatically because 70% of RPA project investment done prior to the implementation. Uh, as for COVID, I think that, you know, the challenges, you know, there are many challenges from a COVID point of view, internal, external, but I think that the impact on the RPA market on the enterprise market, uh, we saw that the discussions within large organization can be Allianz, can be uh, HSBC, JP Morgan Chase, and many other, uh, moved from a department by department implementation, from a tactic discussion to a strategic discussion. Uh, apparently the CEO, the CFO been involved in these discussions. And instead of speaking, how can we expand in one more uh, department, five more departments. The discussion is how can we change the entire organization? How can we transform our organization to be prepared for the, for the future, for the post COVID? And from Crown point of view, one of the changes that we've done is that, you know, we have, we took the process discovery capability, the ability to identify, to map, to understand the user activities, the human activities uh, on the day-to-day -day job. And we, we created a new product line. We call it Upsites. And we let our customers to use the same technology just to monitor and, and better understand what their employees are doing on their day-to-day -day job while they are working from home. One of the main concerns in the market these days, you have you know, 50%, maybe 80% of your employees working from home. And you know you worry sometimes you know um, you sh you should be worried sometimes not, 
and the ability to leverage the technology, the computer vision technology and AI in order to identify and let the company know what, the, you know, what happens behind the scene, what happens over the last week, the last day within my company, that's something very meaningful. Um, so just again, to give you some idea of the innovation that is done due, uh, during COVID and um, you know, the impact on the market post COVID, I believe that we will see insane. So we, we all know that there are a lot of companies now understanding that they need to move to the next step. Anything that can be done by automation will be done by automation. And the impact of COVID, uh, I believe that within a year or two, we'll see you know, an increase, a change in our workspace environment to a completely new uh, area. So let me now invite uh, Uri Rivna, who's co-founder and chief cyber officer of Biocat. Uri, over to you. Hi, um, thank you uh, for the invitation. Um, can we move to the next slide? All right, so let me introduce Biocatch, um, which is a behavioral biometrics company fighting uh, fraud uh, with digital behavioral insights. Um, we work primarily with financial institutions um, and uh, some of our strategic investors uh, beyond our crowd, we are, we're our crowd, uh, a portfolio company are uh, some of the major financial institutions like uh, Citibank, HSBC, American Express, uh, Barclays, and the uh, National Australia Bank. Um, let's move forward with the with the slide. Um, so essentially, what Bycatch does is tracking human behavior uh, and analyzing the interaction of uh, the human being. Um, inside an application to try to understand whether uh, the user is the regular uh, user inside an account uh, and also to try to understand when someone is uh, opening a new account um, is a genuine person versus a, a criminal. Uh, we operate on uh, web and mobile applications and uh, typically uh, you know, focused on financial services, fintech companies and the P2P services. Uh, about 160 people uh, globally. Um, we have a field office in uh, Mumbai and India is a key uh, market for uh, Biocatch. Um, one of the things that uh, might be interesting to uh, note is the fact that um, global crisis uh, points like uh, the pandemic are essentially a, a good point for fraudsters to do rapid innovations themselves. Um, as a company that is fighting fraud, we uh, respond to that uh, quickly. Uh, so I want to give uh, just a, a few examples. Account opening fraud is an amazing sort of trend, specifically in North America, um, because the criminals have all of the information to open accounts on behalf of every American citizen. The data is already traded in the uh, dark web. Um, particularly now that uh, we have uh, you know, uh, COVID and people are uh, not even going to the branch, account opening is becoming a big issue. And fraudsters are beginning to attack that. They also know that fraud companies are, uh, sorry, fraud uh, departments are operating from home. So it's a very, very good position for them to start uh, hitting banks, credit card companies, etc. anything that is doing uh, online uh, account opening. Um, the behavioral biometric capability allows uh, to look at, you know, the account opening process, for example, to see whether a user uh, is familiar with the information that they provide because it's supposed to be your own information. Uh, if you open an account, you should not be familiar with the account opening process. If you're a criminal, you'll be very familiar with the process, but not with the data itself. Another big uh, shift is in real-time P2P fraud uh, because uh, real-time payments are now becoming uh, something that everyone is doing these days. No one walks physically to uh, the branch to do uh, payments. Uh, specifically now with the Corona times. And uh, again, fraudsters are hitting those specific uh, uh, channels. Uh, in the US specifically, they have a new scheme called Zelle, which is real-time P2P. Um, I think in India, you have uh, UPI, which is a similar sort of uh, scheme. Uh, all of this is real-time. Fraudsters like hitting those real-time uh, infrastructure. Um, and because of Corona, there is a concentrated effort to uh, use the opportunity and the attack. Um, a technology like behavioral biometrics can do two things. One is to try 
trying to understand the difference between criminal behavior and uh, genuine behavior in those sort of things, but also profile the regular user behavior uh, inside uh, uh, their sort of account. So for example, let's say that you, when you make a payment, and, and scroll up and down in your uh, web application, uh, you normally use the scroll bar, and all of a sudden we see you using arrows to scroll up and down. We might uh, see you deleting a lot of information, suggesting that you are not familiar with the information that you're now providing, you know, things like that. So that's another uh, trend. And the last thing um, is called deep social engineering. This is when fraudsters are actually tricking users to go into their account and move money. Very clever social engineering stories around it. Uh, and people, again, are sitting at home. They're not uh, communicating with uh, their bank. Uh, they believe that if the bank is calling them and you know asking them to do something, they have to comply. Um, here, it's not about trying to understand whether it's the user or not, because it's the real user going into the account and moving money. It's more about understanding subtle behaviors. For example, in, so, in such situations, the user will be more more hesitant, more distracted. Uh, we see signs of being guided. So someone is giving you instructions and the way you're typing information is going to be different. All in all, process are very uh, adaptive. Uh, they respond fast to these sort of uh, changing conditions. And, um, you know, as a fraud fighting company, our responsibility um, is to, uh, you know, innovate accordingly and, uh, uh, you know, help uh, the financial services to uh, tackle those sort of uh, issues. Thank you, Reed. You know, that's fantastic. And, and you know, for some of you may know, but for others, uh, there, is, uh, there is a huge rise in, in fraud, the cyber fraud in India. Uh, and one reason is the scale. The sheer scale is, is uh, uh, you know, India is the biggest uh, global open market in the world. And I don't count China because China is not an open market. Uh, and we are the largest open market uh, uh, democracy in, in the world. Um, and we recently reached a landmark of uh, a milestone of 750 million internet users. So just, you know, I'm going to repeat that number, 750 million internet users. And I would say that a majority of them are first time users. Uh, a, and second is that they are uh, also, uh, many of them are using mobiles to access the internet. So. Uh, data is, is uh, amongst the cheapest in the world. So, uh, and the third point is that we've had, as, as was mentioned in the previous discussion as well, we've had hundreds of millions, at least 300 million people uh, who have joined the banking ecosystem uh, for the first time and many of them are using digital banking. So they, we have, we've had a payments bank which has launched, uh, which doesn't even use credit cards anymore. It just uses a QR code and many people are using it in an intuitive way and they are not highly literate or educated. Uh, so the options and the opportunities for India are very distinct from a developed market in Europe or in the US. Really. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether uh, some of what you've been doing in terms of innovation could apply to uh, a market where the users themselves need to be educated about how to use it. So it's very fascinating that you're using uh, you know, biometrics, but it also means that you would have tracked their behavior earlier. But how do you manage uh, a first time user and how do you help them? So it's very interesting. Uh, many of the fraud uh, incidents are focused on first time users. Sometimes those will be, you know, elderly people or vulnerable people, people that don't normally bank online. Uh, okay. They have to do it right now because otherwise they don't have access to a physical uh, bank facility. Um, and, you know, this is part of a broader uh, digital transformation uh, trend anyway. So a lot of the fraud, about half of the fraud is actually not for people that have been doing online banking for many years, but new users. So the way to do that is not to rely just on what we know about the user, but also what we know about the criminals the tools that they have. In many cases, they will use bots. They will use tools like remote access. They will try to, to, they will try to trick people to actually put some sort of remote access tool uh, onto their mobile device. Because if you're able to do that, you have full control over that device. If the bank is sending you one-time codes, the, the fraudster will be able to see that. Uh, if the uh, fraudster is connecting uh, to the bank, it will actually connect from the trusted device of the user as opposed to a different device, which is something that the banks are already uh, monitoring. Uh, so that's a tool called remote access and the behavior uh, biometric capability 
is able to uh, detect those sort of uh, incidents. Um, but I would say that definitely criminals behave in a different way. They are far more uh, savvy in using PCs and mobile it's a PC, for example, we will see them using all sorts of shortcuts that people will never use, you know, genuine, honest people will never use, certainly those people that you just described that are uh, themselves today to uh, online banking. So the idea is not just to uh, try to build a profile of what the user is doing, because a lot of the fraud is happening first time users, account opening or people that don't uh, use uh, online or, or mobile banking uh, frequently, and to profile the the way the criminals are operating and the difference between criminal people and uh, genuine people. Thank you. So, you know, there are questions which I have requested you to place. Some questions are coming up. I'll come back to uh, each of the speakers later with specific uh, questions to them. But let me move on uh, to ensure that, you know, the first round of introduction of the companies and their work is, is complete. Uh, may I now invite Tom Goldberg Abramovici, who is the Director of Business Development of Zebra Medical, to uh, share the introduction about uh, her company and uh, the innovation that they've been working on. Over to you, Tom. Yes, hello. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tom. I'm the Director of Business Development at Zebra Medical Vision, and I'll give you a quick introduction uh, to the company. So Zebra has been founded um, around seven years ago, and actually since the inception of the company, we've been pursuing the same thing, which is to teach computers how to read and diagnose um, medical imaging in a way that is fully automatic and in scale. And what do I mean by, by teaching computers? So if you can just click to the next slide. Um, what Zebra has, uh, has done is developed a variety of AI solutions to detect clinical findings. Um, some of these include our bone health solution that is able to detect vertebral compression fractures and our neuro solution, for instance, that can detect intracranial hemorrhage, etc. And these work on, uh, on CTs, x-ray, mammographies, etc. In the basis of the work that we're doing that is fully automatic and is, is built on um, large amounts of data is really the big database that the company has access to. If you can click on the next slide, I'll talk about the database and some other um, Zebra assets. So in the base of what we do, we have access to over 30 million patient scans along with their radiology reports. And that goes over uh, 10 years of patient history. So that allows us to develop these clinical solutions that know, um, that know what happened with the patient over time. And a lot of our research and development is, is built on that. In addition to that, today we're around 90 employees, um, primarily based in Israel, but we actually also have someone in India and uh, pretty large team um, in North America. Um, the access to the, to the data as well as some other company assets has allowed, has allowed us uh, to bring on board some strategic investors, um, as well as uh, get regulatory clearances around the world. Uh, we're one of the leading companies um, in, in AI for radiology um, in terms of number of FDA clearances, uh, CE marks, etc., and um, another pretty uh, pretty cool thing around the, around the FDA is that Zebra was selected along with other uh, companies, very big names in the in the general ecosystem like Google and Apple, to be part of the FDA pre certification program. So it's interesting to see that the FDA is also um, starting to understand that. Uh, AI needs a different approach and that in order to bring innovation forward, they have to adjust to what's happening in the market. And so Zebra is one of the companies which was selected to help lead that effort together hand in hand with the FDA. Um, over time, we've also released um, 11 research publications, our latest one in nature medicine um, and have been granted uh, around 20 patents. Um, and that's where my presentation ends. And I, I'd love to get any questions if you have any. Thank you, Tom. You know, I, I was in uh, uh, Israel last year for Made in Israel, uh, the flagship event, and um, I had a chance to meet uh, some of the HMOs and see the work which was being done. 
And um, I had a small disappointment when I met some of the startups because everybody uh, was was looking at US and Europe. Uh, and you know, when you talk to them about uh, 20 million or 200 million people, they, they didn't understand that. So I love the fact that you talk about doing it at scale. Uh, so there is a tremendous opportunity in India. And of course, you may have heard that uh, earlier this year, uh, the Prime Minister uh, of India launched the National Digital Health Mission. And a lot of that is inspired by the HMO uh, structures of, of Israel. Uh, so we're going to have this digital identity program for, for all uh, citizens in India, apart from universal health care. So there is and, and I must say that, you know, the image scanning that you're talking about, uh, it is now well accepted in the medical circles. Uh, and again, there is a terrific opportunity for, for rolling this out um, uh, at, at uh, you know, several levels because remote healthcare, uh, I think what you're doing, remote healthcare would really benefit from that. So we'll come back to you with some questions from the, from the uh, audience. Uh, and now I'd like to get uh, uh, Dubi to come in and talk about Juganam. Hi, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. As I mentioned, my name is Dubi Lavi uh, from uh, Jugano. And just to let you know, we didn't change the name of the company because of the uh, webinar. Uh, it was established 10 years ago uh, with this name. Uh, we are a company that's uh, based on creating systems that are based on lighting uh, capabilities. And in the last uh, a few months, we've gone through a very interesting uh, uh, process that I'll, uh, I'll define. Can you go? Th so until March this year, we were a normal company that does a very advanced, high quality uh, lighting systems, uh, infrastructure, uh, city and infrastructure, smart cities. The idea that we have is we have a lamp uh, post you take the lamppost, uh, replace the illuminator, and you get a totally connected system because we've integrated the light, communication, cameras, microphones, uh, and uh, wireless communication all into the illuminator. So all you need is power. Uh, horticulture, uh, we provide uh, supplemental lighting and uh, the entire lighting for uh, warm houses or for indoor farming. and uh, retail and commerce, because of the quality of the light and the ease of the installation, uh, it's very, uh, very good. Next slide. So in March, all of a sudden, we found ourselves, uh, we didn't find ourselves, we actually defined it uh, in doing this, going to a total new area of healthcare, also based uh, on lighting. And it was a very interesting process. Next slide, please because we needed to understand a very, a, an entire new area. Uh, what we can see in the picture is a product that we never thought about before March. And we all know that uh, ultraviolet is uh, good for disinfection. Few of us know how uh, ultraviolet A is uh, capable of disinfecting. And based on some studies, we defined a new product, uh, which we call J-Protect. And what we have here is a light that includes both the regular light that's embedded with UVA, which you can, you can be exposed to for an unlimited time uh, without any harm, and UVC, which is a harmful light that is operated with a very uh, robust uh, safety mechanism. The challenges that we found were, first of all, it was an area that wasn't uh, very well known. Uh, we, needed, we needed to understand it. We needed to understand the medical implications. Uh, it was an issue of time to market. And, um, so we need, and we needed to prove the product. What we've managed to do since March is develop the product. We've received an EP, uh, FDA uh, exemption that the product does not need, and it's not a medical device. We re received the EPA approval, and we've actually started marketing and selling the uh, products. And we've actually sold uh, a quantity to a commercial business in Bangalore. So uh, India is a, an interesting market for uh, Jugano, uh, as well as uh, other uh, countries and Israel. 
So uh, we have 43 patents. Most of them are on the lighting capability. And for those who understand lighting, you can see the capabilities of our product, which are the CRI. Um, we have a very low blue light, which is very healthy. So we've gone into the health business in addition to all the rest. Thank you very much. And questions whenever you feel like uh, front job. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby. You know, I'd heard of IoT in lighting, which uh, allows you to figure out and manage space, uh, but uh, disinfection uh, from that. Can you can you go a little bit more into that technology? How does that work? Sure. Uh, so what we found is uh, UVC it creates a change in the DNA of uh, of a virus or, or of a germ. Uh, viruses don't have uh, DNA, um, and what we found is that. When you use UVC, it's a very high energy that does the change. UVA, on the other hand, is a low dose, and you need a lot of time to do it. Uh, our uh, CEO uses a uh, barbecue as a, an example. If you put a steak on a barbecue at 600 degrees, you're going to burn it. If you put a, a steak on a barbecue at 10 degrees, nothing's going to happen to the piece of uh, meat. And if you put the steak on a barbecue at 200 degrees, you're going to cook it very slowly. That's what UVA does to uh, the, the different pathogens. So for UVA, uh, you need the, the time, which is very effective if you're using a room or a hospital room or many others. And the combination between the two is something very, very uh, unique. And it was interesting to find there was quite a few items or articles that included UVA, but there was very little medical data about it. So we've actually done a lot of research ourselves combined with universities in Israel. So is it possible to use it in residential and uh, office spaces as well? Yeah, with the UVC, you need to be out of the room. So you, the UVC operates only when you're out of the room. The UVA works with the current, with the normal lighting. And you can, with, with, we were, we're about 10% less. We're using 10% of the allowed radiation uh, for UVA. So being under our light uh, for 24 hours is like one minute in the sun. UV, there's a lot of UVA in the sun. So it's very, very safe. Uh, one minute in the sun, we, it's going from, the, from our car to the office. Uh, so it's definitely safe. Uh, and as I mentioned, we've been approved by the F F um, uh, EPA and FDA. You know, this is fascinating. I'm sure there'll be a lot of applications. Of course, if you come to North India, uh, you know, in May and June in, in Delhi, uh, standing outside is like being in a barbecue. But, you know, a lot of people say that because of this, uh, some of these conditions, uh, Indians uh, haven't relatively got as much of infection of COVID because uh, generally, we we faced uh, a lot of harsh uh, conditions. You know, I, I'll come back to uh, Yuri now. Uh, you know, on the on some of the points uh, that that were made uh, uh, earlier, and also to uh, to Harel uh, because um, there's some questions which are popping up. But uh, you know, I, I want to go to Harel about RPA because that's something which is very interesting and relatively new. Uh, though, of course, companies like UiPath uh, are very active in India, Harel. I wanted to ask you about uh, when you say desktop application, is it something uh, that uh, smaller companies can also apply? Because sometimes, uh, you know, some of these issues, uh, some of the solutions are meant for large companies with, you know, 300, 400, 500 people. But uh, there are several uh, smaller companies uh, who want to keep their costs low. They want to automate processes. Uh, do you think they could be, uh, you know, are you, are you looking at that as a market as well? Uh, absolutely, yes. So I think that, as, as you mentioned, UiPath, Automation Anywhere, uh, they are quite big in, uh, in India. We actually, we have two offices in India and hopefully we will grow this business uh, more and more uh, every, every year. But I think that the main challenge, even, you know, within the enterprise market, whenever we speak about RPA as a scalable business, you know, we see a lot of new customers coming toward, you know, using RPA. But even for the large companies in the RPA market, we don't see many customers with high scale automation in production. And that's today, today is the main challenge from the corporate point of view. Whenever JP Morgan Chase, uh, AT&T, 
Verizon or any other company approach Quarion in order to better understand how can we scale up? How can we take our automation journey from dozens of uh, automation scenarios to thousands? That's something that today none of the RPA vendor managed to, uh, to achieve. But for your specific question, I would say that, you know, the idea of full cycle automation, that's, you know, one of our main differentiators, the ability from, you know, identification, mapping, and then automating the processes up to production from the full cycle automation capability, the moment that you have that as a SaaS, as, as a service, and you can deliver on that, think of that that the enterprise market, you know, just the beginning of the revolution in the market, because if anyone would be able to do that, like today, anyone can purchase new server in, you know, from AWS, from Azure, or any other uh, cloud provider, they would be able to create more and more bots for their employees, for their companies, with few clicks. That's all. And it should be simple. It should be easy, not by creating large, you know, large uh, communities, uh, large documentation center. It should be simple and easy, like using my iPhone. It should be very simple, very easy. The technology should enable me to identify, to map my automation, and they take that very, in a very simple way. You know, that's absolutely true. As it happens, last couple of days, I was on a jury for India's automation awards and, you know, the applications uh, where they're growing is tremendous. But the fascinating part is that some of the smaller and the younger companies are using it much more than the legacy companies because the legacy and the older and the larger companies, like there's a billion, $11 billion uh, company in India, which is in textiles and others, but they find it more difficult to use uh, RPA and automation because they have to change their processes. It's not just uh, going digital. So I, I think uh, there would be a very wide range of applications uh, that you would see. And, you know, about, uh, I, I wrote my book on rise of automation in India uh, and it was in the market in January, just before COVID. Uh, so, um, but everything that we spoke about and the companies talked about that they would do in the next 12 to 18 months, they've done it between March and now. And the big shift, of course, has been from on-premise to cloud uh, uh, services. So I guess uh, cloud is an important part of innovation for you as well, Haran? Absolutely. Cloud is crucial, I believe, for the future of any, any uh, company in the market. The main challenge, however, is the combination of cloud and on-prem. Because as you said, these large organization, although they managed to do an amazing transformation over the last few months, they still have a combination of some cloud solution, on-prem solution, too many applications, too complex scenario that need to be automated or need to be handled. And I think that you know one of the main values of RPA is the ability to work on this hybrid environment. Either if it's, you know, cloud, you know, 80% cloud, 20% uh, on-prem, or even the transformation itself, you know, bear in mind that you need now to transform your organization to be fully cloud. You need to do that in a simple and easy way that will also be like sort of an A-B testing. You need to, te you know, move some processes to, these, to the cloud environment. Then you need to verify that everything is working well. And just at the end, move to the 100% transformation. And RPA is a crucial part of this journey. Right. And, you know, moving to cloud uh, gets me to talk to Yuri about fraud because moving to cloud also is, is something which creates too much, you know, just accelerates and increases the uh, risk, uh, Uri. There was a question in the chat box which says that, you know, uh, referring to my earlier discussion with you uh, on education, uh, you know, educating people who don't understand what is cyber fraud, is there a, is there a business model around it? How do you, how do you do that at scale? Um, I would say that um, education is one layer in all of this, right? Uh, I don't know, you can call it like the first line of defense. And um, typically this is done by banks and the government. A government would uh, invest in, you know, public uh, information uh, campaigns specifically around uh, certain types of uh, vulnerabilities and uh, attacks. So during the phishing days, uh, there were a lot of uh, campaigns around that. Um, in many countries, you would have 
problem of uh, mule accounts. Mule accounts are collaborators with criminals, but typically the mule accounts don't really know that because the criminals would approach people and say, hey, you should work, you can work from home. You're going to receive some money into your account and then you will send it to other accounts and you'll get a commission and you'll be like a financial officer and they give you a good reason for what, why you want to do that. Uh, you might be even like a student or, or a, even a high school a student uh, if you have a bank account and essentially a lot of people fall for that. So several governments uh, globally invested in that area and said, don't be a mule, like you, you're, you're playing to the hands of uh, criminals. And obviously, you don't you want to you don't want to do that. Um, I would say that education is difficult. The reason is that process are very clever, very adaptive. And uh, it kind of changes all the time. You know, people ask me, hey, what sort of what sort of fraud should we expect next year? My answer is, I don't know. These guys are very clever. They always come up with new innovation and uh, new things. So it's difficult to keep track on, on those sort of uh, things and try to educate everyone about all of these things. Uh, the banks will be focused on their, you know, uh, small uh, real estate of, let's say, online banking, mobile banking, and be very focused on specific types of attacks that are hitting them. But they also are concerned because they don't want to scare people off the digital world branches are being closed. You don't want to make people concerned about doing things digitally. It's a very delicate uh, uh, balance, I would say. But certainly, if there's a way to uh, uh, create like an education campaign or uh, certain things that the banks can use on their website that are not going to be too alarming, but just, you know, use common sense sort of things, could be videos, could be like a small education capabilities. I think there's a market for that. Uh, I would just say this is just one line of defense. Historically speaking, um, it's not stopping the big fraud campaigns. It is a component um, that uh, you know people are investing in. Uh, it's one line in, in a defense strategy around fraud. So one, one quick question and a short answer from Yuri, that in the last six months with so many people working from home, have you noticed new uh, risks coming up which you had probably not seen earlier? Um, Many of these uh, fraud cases that I talked about, uh, you know, did uh, a complete revolution in, in, in the last uh, six months. Again, the fact that people are working from home, uh, they're suspect to all sorts of social engineering campaigns. Uh, hey, we are the bank. We know that you haven't been to the branch for several months now. Uh, we are updating our records. Social engineering and uh, the pandemic go hand in hand very, very well. And the process of very cleverly, uh, you know, tapping that sort of uh, uh, opportunity. This is one thing. Uh, there's also things that are not fraud related. Uh, let's call them uh, trust and safety related. Uh, so for example, think about someone who is providing a customer service uh, to many, many organizations, uh, cu customer service capability. So they typically will have big uh, halls full of people that provide a lot of uh, customer service uh, uh, you know, functionality to many organizations, let's say telcos and cable companies, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all of this moves to home, right? So the same people that were sitting in big halls are now doing it from home. Uh, however, uh, they want to, uh, you know, generate more revenue. So what they will do is they will use their computer and their account, okay, and share it with family members, with neighbors, with people they don't even know because they know that this uh, account, which is verified, uh, is providing service to a lot of uh, companies. Now think about it, this is a problem because the person that is supposed to give the service on behalf of, let's say, a big telco, uh, accessing a lot of sensitive data and records, was vetted, background checked, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's the neighbor or a family member or someone else uh, logging into the same account, you know, simply by sharing uh, credentials. So this is becoming a huge issue. How would you know that the person that is supposed to give that service is really the one that is giving the service? It's a way to verify the individual, not just the account itself or the credentials of that account. Giving you one example of something that is now happening during COVID. Thanks, Yuri. That's, that's uh, most useful to know. Uh, and you know, uh, I hope more companies adopt it. And that question, by the way, was asked by Sanjay. I didn't mention the name earlier. Uh, Tom, I'd like to come to you. You know, you, you talked about real-time uh, analysis and image scanning. 
uh, and uh, the, the uh, challenge in real time, uh, any activity which is real time, especially when you're looking at uh, assessing images, is the uh, quality of bandwidth and the connectivity. You know, the platform we are on, Zoom, for example, became successful because it could operate in low bandwidth. Uh, now, how does, uh, you know, when you uh, and your company looks at emerging markets where perhaps the bandwidth is not going to be as good, or even within within India, you know, there will be different levels of uh, quality of connectivity. Well, if I'm in an urban center, maybe good. But even in an urban center or on a peak time, you know, there's too much pressure on, on, on bandwidth. How do you see that uh, solution rolling out in a low bandwidth situation? Yeah, so we actually have current installations in India as, as well, like for example, at, at Apollo hospitals in, in India. Um, it's not a problem that we're seeing at the moment. Um, we also don't um, overload the, the servers so much just because whenever a scan comes in, it comes in automatically based on certain forwarding rules. So for example, every CT um, chest or abdomen CT of a patient who's over like 50 years old would automatically be sent for us to, uh, to us for analysis. And so it's not like a big chunk of, of uh, data being sent every time and um, getting the, the servers stuck, but instead it's, it's every study, you know, one after the other in, in essence. Um, and so we don't see much of a problem with that. Uh, that being said, we always have, like, we are very like a cloud first company, but we also have an on-premise uh, solution in, in cases where there's really no, no way around it. But we haven't seen too many of these cases actually. Tom, tell us a little bit about your India experience, you know, of your companies. Uh, I'm sure it's been pretty unique uh, from the other markets you operated. Uh, what were the challenges and what were the uh, great successes? Sure. Um, so I work very closely with our salesperson um, who's in India and, and he has vast experience in, in working in, um, in, in the medical industry in India. Um, my role at the company is, is first and foremost business development and thinking of new strategic areas for the company um, uh, to grow in, but also I manage our channel partnerships and these are primarily distribution uh, distribution channels. And we keep adding more uh, as we go. So um, we have encountered some distribution channels, potential ones in India. The, the bigger surprise, I think, um, for, for my team was the openness of the market, like very ready to try it out, very, very early adopter in, um, in nature which was really great. Um, and then the challenge was mostly, I think like in, at least in our industry was the business model. And um, we work with uh, recurring fees, like annual recurring fees mostly. And um, the distributors we have, um, we have uh, talked with and, and discussed with in India were mostly like a one-time payment and then um, and then some maintenance fees. So add on that, that in, in, in India, the prices are generally lower than what we're seeing in North America, for instance. Um, whenever we want to incorporate or embed our software into their offering, we always have to find a very, very low price point so that it would match the market. So I think um, that's, that's where the, um, the challenge was. Right, Tom. That's that's good to know. But I, I'm sure you know this is where the innovation comes in. How do you how do you overcome uh, challenges in situations like this? Uh, so coming to Dubi now, Dubi, you you also you refer to the fact that some of your installations are in India. But uh, is there any experience that you'd like to share for for uh, for the listeners and the audience? I totally agree with Tom. I think the the way to work in India. Uh, is almost like a, it's like any other, any other country. You have to understand the, the system. You need to understand the culture, and you need to adapt to make sure that you're working correctly. The best way is to find a good a good uh, distributor, someone locally that you can partner or get to some type of business agreement and work to together. Uh, for a company like ours that we're prov we're providing hardware. It's very difficult when you're a small company and not a corporate to distribute yourself. So uh, what we've done in India is we have someone who's our distributor right now locally, 
uh, in the uh, Bangalore area. Maybe we need uh, additional distributors because India is so big. Uh, but I totally agree with the Tom's experience. But some, for something like you, uh, do with the product you have, what about uh, working or collaborating with a larger company which is in the electricals business? Because your products are not necessarily competing because you're you're adding value with a completely new set of qualities. Right. So for, for our company, for instance, one of the things that we've understood recently was we have two different products. The J-Protect, which is the disinfection capability, we need to market with a different channel than our street lighting or our interior, internal uh, lighting. Uh, the interior lighting and the street lighting, we need to go to the lighting companies, the construction companies, and so forth. And on the J-Protect, we most probably need to go through medical channels, medical distribut distributors like uh, J&J that we saw earlier. Uh, and if we're talking about our uh, horticulture, the agriculture, maybe we need to go through companies like we spoke about PepsiCo on our side of the uh, uh, of the uh, discussion earlier, but we need to find local partners, each with its expertise in each, in, in each area of, uh, of product. And it's not one solution. But what about manufacturing? I think scale would be important for that, right? Local manufacturing. We do that. Uh, we, we do that. We've, uh, we've, we, we've been very strong in South America. So we've established a assembly uh, plant in, uh, in Mexico. Uh, and if we start, if we have large enough uh, orders from India or from any other country, we, can, we definitely can do it. It will save time, it will save price, and it will benefit, benefit both countries because we're providing uh, work in India and getting the product qu uh, to the market quicker. So sure. Right. So, you know, I think we've, we've got a few questions and uh, we started early so we can end early as well. It's, is there anybody else who would like to... Uh, ask another question or or maybe would any of the panelists want to ask a question to each other? No. So, go ahead. Were you saying something to me? No, no. Sorry. All right. So, you know, I think with this, uh, we can perhaps uh, end this session because uh, we've got a very good idea of what's happening in terms of the latest technologies. We've also seen examples of how innovation has happened in a time of crisis where companies have been able to create something new, which is very relevant and contextual. Uh, so I, I think those are something that, uh, those are issues which are, which cut across markets, which cut across uh, sectors, uh, an approach to innovation, which is very, very agile. Uh, and of course, as, as uh, all the four speakers said, that very, very rooted in the local market you have. So it's quite possible that the innovation that works in one market may not be relevant for the other. So perhaps you also need to have a region specific uh, innovation uh, approach. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for being here and I'll, uh, you know, very fascinating and I'm, I'm going to be in touch with all of you separately because I'm sure there are a lot of great conversations we can have later, uh, but I'm going to hand it over back to Dan now. Over to you, Dan. Thanks, Thank uh, Pranjal. That concludes uh, our session for today. Um, we'd love to uh, stay in touch with everyone that has been on this panel. Please reach out to us. Um, I'm going to put my, my email address uh, on, the, uh, on the chat box uh, and I'm happy to connect you with either the, the speakers uh, or the entrepreneurs uh, we've met today. Thank you very much. Uh, stay healthy and hope to see you either in, in India or here in Israel. Thanks a lot.